The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. Two thousand years ago, there's a certain man who entered history. His name was and is Jesus Christ. He came, he lived, he taught, he preached about repentance, he preached about his kingdom. Basically, the kingdom of God, he said, is at hand. Some people received the message, some people rejected him. Some people didn't stop till they saw him die on the cross. After he died on the cross, they put him in a tomb, and before he left, he said, I'm coming back again for you. So after he rose again from the dead, with this assurance, he gave the Holy Spirit to these believers called the church, and this church still exists today because of his miraculous power and grace. But my friends, Jesus Christ promised that he's coming back, and the days that he, the Bible talks about, these end days are very specific and very clear about what will happen and what needs to happen uh, in the church, in the body of Christ. So in order to understand this, God gave us the privilege to reveal these truths in the book, the last book of your Bible, just like any other textbook. If you need to know the answers, the answers are at the back, you know. So this book of Revelation is at the back, and you have the answers for the coming of the Lord. And the word Revelation, the book of Revelation is just revelation, it's not revelations. It's singular. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And through him, we understand the times, we understand the seasons. And this is what the Bible says in uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. John, the beloved disciple of Christ, sees Jesus Christ in his resurrected power. The Bible says he fell like dead in Revelation chapter 1. He was so astonished by the power and majesty of Christ. And Christ says, I have a message for you, John. Record this. Note this down. And he sees a picture of Christ standing amidst the golden lampstands. Way back last year, that means the beginning of the series, I covered about how Christ is the priest standing before the lampstand, which is the menorah. The Old Testament lampstand is called the menorah that has seven branches to it. So what John sees is Christ trimming the wicks and those lamps that are on these on this branches <clears throat> so that the oil or the Holy Spirit would pass amid the light that uh, they're supposed to. So even today, for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ expects for us to be prepared. He expects each and every one of us to be ready to receive him. That means it requires transformation in our own lives. That requires obedience to the truth and the commandments of God. He cannot live a wishy-washy life, as even as I was preaching last week about who we are in Christ Christ expects us to have this right standing with him by having him as a Lord and Savior. And once we stand in this position, we go through this process of discipleship, of sanctification, putting away the things that he doesn't want us to have in our lives and holding on to the things and receiving the things that he already has prepared for us. That is sanctification, the transformation. We grow from strength to strength. We grow from maturity to maturity, from glory to glory in the knowledge of Christ. That is what is expected of every believer. The word born again, if you look at the scripture, is only used twice or thrice, three times. Thrice? You have thrice here? Okay, we have thrice in British English, I think. Okay? It is used two or three times, the word born again. But the word the kingdom of God is used hundreds of times. The problem is not you becoming born again. The problem is after you become born again, what next? How can you be the disciple of Christ? This is growth. This is maturity. And that's what God expects. And God has this, uh, all these pre, um, I wouldn't call it conditions, but God said in the scripture, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
Since you receive this incorruptible seed that is Jesus Christ, he expects us to strive diligently and be good workers to grow in maturity of the knowledge of Christ. So here is Christ trimming these branches, giving a message to John. And chapters 2 and 3 are the letters written to seven churches that really existed in history. And these two chapters are very critical for every believer because it prepares us as to what God is expecting from us and what we need to do as a result of his commandments. Every letter, as we saw before, has a similar structure, as a name, a title, a commendation, concern, exhortation, a promise to the overcomer, and most importantly, an instruction. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, we all have ears, it's a personal application. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The letter is not only relevant to that church that it was written to, but it's also relevant to you and I today. What God said in the book of Revelation is relevant to you and us, to you and I. We saw, so far we've seen four churches. We saw the, saw the church of Ephesus. They were so stringent in their doctrine. This is the very first church. They were so caught up in the doctrine that they left their devotion. Or the devotion was going down. God expects a balance. A doctrine and devotion together. Doctrine has its boundaries for your devotion. Just because we have devotion doesn't mean we do whatever we want. Our devotion needs to be confined to the truth of God's word. That's Church of Ephesus. We saw Smyrna, how God tells them to end your persecution. He says, hang in there, guys. Satan will bring opposition. People will die, but hang in there. Pergamum, he talks about purified allegiance. God says, you know, I need spiritual chastity. We need purity. We need to set ourselves free from the things of this world. We need to uh, walk out of the things that hold us captive. And Thyatira, we saw, we saw the pagan practices that were involved and how God wants us to come out of those. Then we move on to this next church, the church of Sardis. To the angel of the church of Sardis, write. This is what John, uh, Christ said. John write about a letter to the church of Sardis. The word Sardis is very hard to find a definition. The scholars have a lot of perplexity uh, to define this name Sardis and because they're uncertain of the origin of the name. They say it's lost through antiquity, but... Some majority of the scholars agree that it has to do with something called the Sardis stone or the red stone, it's a reddish yellow stone, which is used very much in the ancient times for making seals. It's a very tough stone that you can carve and chisel. It is highly vulnerable too, it's susceptible as well, this stone. It's a, it's a very good stone, but sadly it's used a lot in the ancient days and slowly it's lost its value. What started off to be a precious stone gradually became common. Well, that's exactly what this letter is all about. What the church of Sardis started out to be is a, is a very precious church, but slowly it became common. It had lost its significance. It has lost its identity. It had a name, but it was empty. That's what this whole letter is about. It had a name but it was empty. Very similar to our Christian life sometimes. We can have the name of a Christian, but we could be absolutely empty as well. We can live with that name on, but we may not be able to fulfill the lifestyle that a Christian requires. Sardis had a name, but lost its value. What was precious became common. 700 years before Sardis came into existence, it was one of the greatest cities in the world and supposed to be one of the oldest cities in Asia. It was the ancient, ancient capital of a kingdom named, known as the Lydian Empire around 1200 BC. It's a very strategic location for travel for Pergamum, Smyrna, Ephesus, Philadelphia, and Phrygia. And it favored commerce a lot. Sardis favored commerce a lot and slowly it became very wealthy. And the very first coins that you, uh, the, in the recorded history that existed in the world, come from Sardis, known as the Lydian uh, staters. 
These were the first coins that existed around 6th century BC. At its peak, there was a king named Croesus, and there was a river that runs to this town called Pactolus River. These are the images of that. They became known or became significant for prosperity and wealth. So if you talk about Croesus or the Pactolus River, apparently they mined for gold in this river. So every time you talk about these Croesus or Pactolus, pe people thought you're talking about prosperity. If you, nowadays, if you talk about Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, or, yeah, they're significant for their wealth or their achievements in life, or Warren Buffett. This, that's the same thing that existed in the town of Sardis. And this town, this is one of the most amazing stories that I want you to focus on. It's situated upon a, upon a thousand foot, uh, feet high cliff. And in, uh, it, it rises very quickly in a valley called Hermas at the foot of Mount Timulus. Timulus. I can't even say that name. It's very hard. How do you pronounce T and then? You know, there's something called the silent alphabets. Have you heard about those things? I like, why do you keep silent things before pneumonia? There's a P before N. You don't use that P, but it is there. That's English for you, ladies and gentlemen. It's one of those things. This mountain is there, and this valley is there, and there's this rapid cliff that arises 1,000 feet high upon which this town of Sardis is there. It's known for its security. In, uh, you know, in the ancient days, the kings used to build on high places because they can watch this, uh, strategically how the enemy is trying to come and attack. But the only problem with this town of Sardis is this cliff is entirely made of clay. And it was highly susceptible for erosion, continuous erosion. So it was untrustworthy. There were cracks that they were de developing before, uh, as time progressed because of erosion. And it could be easily exploited. But listen to this. The Sardinians, Sardinians just sounds like sardines, right? Sardin, the, I don't want to live there. Sardis, okay, these people had something called the false confidence. False confidence that they were secure. Outwardly, they seemed fully confident without the reality. The reality is the cliff is eroding away. These people lived with uh, promise, but there was no performance. Outwardly, there was a lot of strength, but they were betrayed because of the lack of want of being watchful and being diligent. In other words, they began to slack off, thinking that they were secure. There's one story I'll tell you, I'll share with you. In 549, King Cyrus laid a siege to Sardis for 14 days siege. They didn't know how to get up upon that cliff and take the city down. Croesus, the king of Lydia, was there, and uh, the people were, uh, the Persian Empire, there was, uh, Cyrus and the rest of his soldiers were down there. They didn't know how to get up. And King Cyrus offered his soldiers, they said, if anybody could find a way to get up onto these battlements and get into this fortress and destroy the city, I'll give him a great reward. One of his soldiers, Cyrus' soldiers, named Herodias, noticed that one of these Lydian soldiers it dropped his helmet from these battlements. That helmet rolled down the cliff, and he noticed how that soldier got down through these cracks on the cliff to retrieve his helmet. Then Herodias went back to Cyrus and said, I got a strategy. That very night, a Persian party, a group of soldiers, clambered through those exact same eroded points and got into the town, destroyed the city of Sardis. And historians today say this city was taken over by the thief in the night. The city was taken over by the thief in the night. The city was so relaxed. This city was so confident that even uh, the Croesus, the king of the Lydian Empire, he said, ah, oh, they can't climb the cliffs and, cliffs, and they didn't even have soldiers around. It was taken out very strategically and very easily. So Sardis had a name, but lost its value. They were too confident and too prideful in their achievements and, and their position. They realized, yeah, we are secure. But in fact, they were a fair game, and they became a fair target, an easy target for the enemy. 
So Sardis, Sardis has a decimal, decimal history. In 549, it fell to the Persians. In 501, it, bur it was bun burned by Ionians. It surrendered to Alexander the Great in 334 BC. In 332, it was taken over by Antigonus. And at 214, it fell to the Seleucid, Seleucids. So it is known as a city of failure. These people kept being confident. Here's the thing. It's not a one-time, the story that I narrated to you, it's not a one-time event. Time and time again, the people of Sardis were relaxed, thinking that they were secure. And time and time again, they were taken over. You know, Heigl said one thing. If teachers, history teaches us something, is that man never learns from history. That's what history teaches. Man never learns from history. So they knew it's the same problem occurring again and again and again. Sardis became a city of failure, synonymous with the presumptions or the pretensions which were unjustified. They had an appearance without reality, full of false confidence, and they betrayed by the lack of being watchful and being diligent. And that's exactly what Christ is saying to the church of Sardis. You have stopped being watchful. You have stopped being diligent. All this splendor of the city of Sardis was gone down in 1780 when there was a major, major earthquake that took down the whole city. And today, you know, an archaeological dig started in 1910, and after 50 years, they found only little remnants of the city. What was once a popular city became a nobody's town. To this church, that was all introduction, by the way. To this church, Christ gives a message. And this is what the Bible says. To the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. What does it mean, seven spirits? It's not about God having seven spirits. There is only one Holy Spirit. But it talks about the sevenfold function of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. God is saying, it, was, it is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it or a thing. He is a person. And he says, the spirit of wisdom in Isaiah 11, 2, we see the scripture. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and the knowledge. The spirit, spirit of power and the fear of God. The sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. If this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit that a church requires for us to be watchful. If you have no Holy Spirit, my friends, we are cutting off the lifeline for the reason why a church, church exists and a church will die without the Holy Spirit. It's because of the Holy Spirit we'll be watchful. And Christ says, this is the one. He identifies himself with that title. Here's the concern. He says, I know your works. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. It's amazing how it fits into the actual history of the city itself. He's saying to the believers, you have a name. The word is called onoma, name or reputation. You have a label. People at Seaside, we might have a label called Christians, but we might be dead. The word name, the letter name is used uh, three times in six verses again and again. God says there is no remedy for a person who lives only with the name but doesn't have a lifestyle. One of my favorite stories, there was a battle, severe battle that was going on. Alexander's army was fighting the battle. And there's one soldier who was running away from the battle. And these generals capture him and bring him to Alexander and says, Alexander is so furious with this guy. And he says, who are you? Why are you running away? And this guy is like, no, I'm scared of the battle and all that. So he's running away. He says, Alexander asks him, what is your name? The guy who's running away he says, my name is Alexander. He says, you either change your name or change your lifestyle. You carry the same name that I do, behave like I do. You call yourself a Christian, be a Christian, live like one. Christian means a Christ follower. Be a Christ follower. Do not compromise. Church of Sardis missed it. They had a name, false confidence, no watchfulness, no diligence. Any commendations? You saw the pattern of the letter. Any commendations? Sorry to say, this only one of the two churches, only two churches never received any compliments from Christ. This is one of those churches. No commendation whatsoever. 
So even before we get into further uh, things about the Church of Sardis and how it applies, I just want to take a quick uh, prelude by talking about the prophetic profile. One of the things I said is when you go through the seven letters, it fits in with the timeline in history and how every church, in the sense, the period of time is represented in these letters. Church of Sardis represents the denominational church. It represents the denominational church. So I'm going to explain something very important in, a, in this next little while. Somebody said to me the other day, when I come to church, I feel like I'm going to a Bible school. Hope you feel that way. I want to make a Bible school right here. We want to be good students of the Word of God. Are you okay with that? Okay? So we'll give you a little bit of history about what this denominational church is all about. I try to make it interesting, but that's only so far I can go. I can't make it any more exciting than what I can do with it. Okay? In 13th century, papacy means the office of the popes. It became very dominant, but it was vulnerable to attacks. Why? Because the office of Christian church or the popes became greedy with immorality and ignorance. The officials were corrupt and they were taxing the ordinary farmers and peasants. And they acquired the papal lands that you see on the map there. One-fifth to one-third of European lands were acquired by this church. And this incited envy and resentment among common people. They began to hate the church. And during this time, a reformation was born. The first person in the 14th century that we hear about is John Whitcliffe. He was bold. He attacked papacy for the sale of indulgences, sale of prayers. He, uh, he came against the excessive veneration or the uh, sanctification or the exaltation of the saints. He questioned the moral and intellectual standards of the ordained priest. He also did something so wonderful. In order to reach the common people, he translated the Bible into English. For that, people were burnt at the stake alive. The Bible that we carry today, my friends, people were killed for the making of it. And each average Christian has two or three Bibles in his home. So how much do we value what people shed blood for? John Whitcliffe was one of them. Then came the invention of Gutenberg Press. That's a machine that was used for printing. The first movable metal type printing press was uh, invented, and the first book that is ever published in history was the Bible itself. So Gutenberg Press by jo uh, Johannes Gutenberg of Mainz, Germany in 1455 produced this metal printing that could make multiple copies. What happened as a result? The truth began to spread to ordinary people. Scholarly studies began to develop among Luther, Calvin, and other reformers. The Bible became a source of inspiration. And slowly, people started realizing that traditions that the church has been imposing were contrary to the Bible or the Word of God, that what God is saying in the Bible. So the battle began between the truth of the Word of God and the traditions of man, which still continues, by the way. The battle between truth and the traditions. Martin Luther, on October 31st, 1531, he nailed the 95 Thesis to the door in Wittenberg College, that's when they say reformation was born. The revolution was born. That's what Protestants came about through this. But they were already a radical group of people who denied the Catholic Church when they were still existing. But the actual event of history, they put the timeline on this. And after this, major wars broke out, my friends. German Protestants, war on German Protestants, war on Protestants of Netherlands, the Huguenot Wars, Philip's attempt to, against England, the Thirty Years' War. There was a major war. The Pope was attempting to control at any cost. So there was major wars, major bloodshed, millions, I said millions of people died for the sake of the truth. It was a bad time in church history which we covered. So did we do any better? What happened to Christianity after Reformation? Say Martin Luther, Reformation was born, the Protestants came about. Let me give you a little chart which will describe. Initially, it was an undivided church. You know, in Acts, there was this bunch of new Christian believers, men of the way. They sought the Lord. They still worshipped in synagogues, still met at the temple. It was going well. But the Romans, we saw in the church of Thyatira, we saw Chosa in the church of Pergamos, where the compromise of religion and state came about. They became one. The Catholic church was born. 
There's only one church that existed during that period, the Catholic Church. But when Roman Empire divided, what happened? The Eastern Empire and the Western Empire divided. The church also split. On the Western side, it became the Catholic Church. On the Eastern side, it became the Orthodox Church. They both were rivals to each other, but they almost functioned in the same way with all the uh, indulgences and all the system was the same, same religious system. So from here, from the Catholic Church, the Protestant Reformation has happened. You see how the church is dividing? The Protestantism came into existence, Martin Luther, 15th century. So one, the Protestantism started, various denominations began to offshoot out of Protestantism. The church began to further divide. The fundamental issue was Orthodox Church, Catholic Church, and Protestantism is who is the authority? Protestant Church began to say the scripture is the ultimate authority. Catholic Church and Orthodox Church traditions and rules of men that are mixed up with uh, the scripture, they called that the authority. That was the battle. That's the whole scenario in brief terms. So when Reformation started, various groups started to come out. The parts of Europe, the Christians start to break away. Reformed Christianity started in Switzerland with the teachings of Swingley and Calvin. In Scotland, John Knox brought about Presbyterians. In Switzerland, became the birthplace of Anabaptists, who are the spiritual ancestors of Amish, Mennonites, Quakers, and the Baptists. Anglicanism started in 1534 by King Henry VIII, which broke off from the Pope. Episco uh, Episcopalianism. Oh, man, that's hard. I'm glad I don't belong to that denomination. It's hard to say that name. That's all. That's all there is. Hard to say that name. Right? And it, it became Episcopalianism in America. Methodism began to start out of this from John Wesley's teaching, which has roots in Anglicanism. So what happened with the denominations is Luther reformed it. Free churches freed it. Baptists baptized it. Quakers dry cleaned it. Salvation Army put uniform it. Pentecostals anointed it, Charismatics renewed it, but the church has lost its value from the truth of the scriptures and became a big spectator sport, still incorporating paganic rituals and practices within it. That is our history. I wouldn't say proud history, but that is our history. How are denominations born? Very simple equation. Some people will say, well, I like the Holy Spirit a lot. I want to highlight Holy Spirit a lot more than other doctrines. Slowly, they incorporate a human opinion. People say, oh, that seems right. And slowly, the denominations evolve. And what happens as the course of time goes, the human opinion takes importance and the doctrine goes down. And that's when you, the infighting begins. The truth matters. But truth matters as long as it's aligned with the word of God. Opinions of man have destroyed church. And you need to make sure it never dominates. Opinions are okay, but never should dominate the truth of the word of God. And that's how denominations evolve, my friends. We got to be careful. When the truth of the Bible is modified, when it's tweaked, we are in big trouble. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. You know, Satan does a good job in trying to disrupt the unity with the truth within the body of Christ. The very first shocker I had when I was in a, in a church, I was playing in the music team. There was one day a big issue. What happened? Some other ministries took the pens from the music team. And it was a big issue. I said, man, oh man, how we fight. Even within the church, how we have this beautiful groupisms. Oh, my music ministry, nobody should come near it. What is happening to church? The body of Christ, one body, one spirit, one truth. I'm not saying compromise. I'm saying truth, truth, truth. That's what a church is built. Question everything in the light of the scripture. As long as it aligns, we can get along. That's what there is. So false confidence was reflected in the character of Christians, of Sardis. False confidence in the opinions of man. They began to dominate. That's what this prophetic profile is all about. They have the appearance of the reality of truth, but outwardly they're just a mockery. Their strength is betrayed. They were not watchful. And church began to split and split and split. And today <coughs> we are subject to a joke to this world when it talks about various denominations, various churches. 
We don't even know how to properly come to the truth of the word of God. It's very hard nowadays. And this is the exhortation that Christ gives in, uh, amidst this false conference. This exhortation, he says, Be watchful, strengthen in the things that remain, that are ready to, uh, ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know whatever hour I come upon you. The first two words, be watchful. Talks about the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. There were five wise, five foolish. We as believers need to be watchful. Last night I was thinking. I was saying, okay, if I want to go on a trip tomorrow morning, how would I be ready? Say it's a long trip. Yes, not only do I pack my suitcase. Every time I go to India, it's a huge regiment of things. My wife packs my suitcase, by the way. But it's so hard to know what... I forget what I don't forget. And if you're all going as a family, hey, did you turn off the lights? Did you lock the basement door? You know, you're still driving and you're thinking about it. You, you understand what I'm saying, right? So we are so prepared to leave for a period of time that you make sure that every bit is ready. Now, Bible says Christ is coming back. How are we preparing ourselves for the return of the Lord? Are we that diligent in a way that we are ready for this trip? That we are willing to let go of the things that we hold on to in this world. We say, Lord, we value eternal life. We value everything that is going to come in the future. But I want to hold on and grab on to these things of the world. I want bigger property, bigger income, bigger this, bigger that, bigger toys. And are, are, are we living in a way as pilgrims and strangers on this world, as peculiar people willing to let go in anticipation of the coming of the bridegroom so that nothing will hold us down to, get, uh, to this world? Are we living with that lifestyle? Are we preparing ourselves for the return of the Messiah? If not, Christ says, be watchful. Romans 13, 11 says, do this knowing the time that now it is the high time to awake out of our sleep for now the salvation is nearer than we first believed. Bible calls anything lack of preparation as sleepiness, as drowsiness. Don't fall asleep, seaside. Christ is coming back again. Be watchful. 1 Corinthians 6, 16, 13 says, Watch, stand fast in faith, be brave, and be strong. No matter what the world throws at you, you got to be brave, you got to be strong. What are, we, what are the things that we need to be watchful for? Be watchful for the schemes of the enemy, the vials of the devil. Anticipate how he's going to take you down. In what area? Watch, be watchful about that. Be watchful against temptation. Temptation creeps upon you. Be watchful. Know how to bring your thoughts into captivity, into the obedience of Christ. We need to be watchful for his coming. It's not done much among Christian communities. Sadly, sad to say that. But we need to be watchful for his coming. And also... Be watchful against false teachers who bring about deception so that you wander away from the truth of the word of God. If churches don't open the Bibles, run away from the church. That's not the place you need to be. And the day I stop feeding you, get out of Seaside Community Baptist Church. The day the word of God is not preached here, run, go to the place where they feed you. I strongly encourage you to do that. Beware of false teachers. Beware of deception. And Christ also uses this word and says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. What does that mean? Strengthen the things that remain. Church of Sardis is falling apart. They're not being watchful. When you're not watchful, things will fall apart. There are few things Christ is saying that are still remaining. Hold on to them. That's what Christ is saying. The great truths today in churches are being lost. Example, justification by faith alone. It's lost with cheap grace, has been replaced with cheap grace. Cheap grace means do whatever you want. God still loves you and he'll take you to heaven. Your bad will, uh, good will outweigh your bad. It's never a biblical principle. Don't believe in that lie. Grace has become cheap. Be watchful. The inerrancy of the word of God, that absolute truth is now being diluted. Only 60% of American Christians believe that Bible is absolute word of God. 60%. It's either whole or nothing. You cannot deny the absoluteness and the evidence of the truth of the word of God. The scripture is 100% true, and there's no other way to believe that. It's not a bunch of allegorical myths. 
and people have lost, the, uh, the deny the place of Israel's right and its destiny. They lose focus on the imminent return on Christ. And my, my friends, we are losing the things, the, the things that are remaining are being lost. The depravity of man. Nobody talks about sin. Everybody is good nowadays. You're just prone to do bad things now and then. The Bible calls you're sinful. You're prone to become good only through Christ. The string, things are turning upside down. The Bible says our heart is incurably wicked. Let's talk about it. It is true. Our heart is incurably wicked, but only Christ can make it whole. He'll replace this heart and give you a new heart. Christ can do that, if only you believe. The redemption in the blood of Christ, nobody wants to talk about the blood of Christ. We don't hear the preciousness of his sacrifice. Pagan fallacies. Pagan fallacies have crept into our churches. It's a evolutionary myths are being taught in schools. Remember that evolution is faith as well. If somebody says a big bang has happened, a little protoplasm turned into a tadpole, then a reptile, a little monkey, then a man like me, it takes a greater faith to believe in that concept than to believe that God made everything in six days. They keep changing the three billion to two billion. Did anybody see that? Nobody saw that. Evolution is taught as faith, but not only does it remain as a biological science, it influences the society that we live in. It influences the culture. When you believe that there is no God, evolution is the faith of an atheist. If you believe that there is no God, your culture is influenced by it and you act like animals because there is no accountability. The psychology is being influenced by evolution as well. The laws are being defined by this evolutionary science. Saying if a guy is a pedophile, it's because of his genetic constitution. That's what the law is saying. What kind of world are we living in? Morally depraved, sinful world. And the great truths of the word of God are being lost. Even in churches, we need to hold on to them. That's what Christ's instruction, Christ's instruction is. And also he says, I have found your works, uh, I have not found your works perfect before God. You know, it's by grace through faith we are saved. The very next verse he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not only we experience salvation, but we need to be diligent in living our lives with all devotion. Without him, we can't. Without us, he won't. We need that sincere, regular, committed life to be a disciple. That's what Christ is saying. I have not found your works. Then he continues to say, Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you do not watch, I'll come upon you as a, thief in, as a thief, and you will not know the hour I will come upon you. Hold fast, repent, and you won't be caught in surprise. That's what the Bible is saying. He will come in the thief, as a thief in the night for those who are not prepared. The city of Sardis was invaded by the Persians as a thief in the night because they were not prepared. We who are prepared and already anticipating the coming of the Lord, we will not be surprised. That's what God Christ is saying. You will not be surprised at my coming because you're already set, you already set your mind and your heart and your soul to, to his return. And you're not ignoring the times that you're living in. But once you ignore these things, you will be soon taken over and resulted in a downfall of Sardis. So we need to watch out and be diligent in our anticipation as we walk circumspectly and wisely and wait for the return of Christ. It will not come as a surprise. The coming of the Lord will not come as a surprise. In the verse 4, he says, You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Even in Sardis, in this church, that is falling apart in this church where there's compromise and not being watchful. Christ says, hey, by the way, there are a few guys in your church who are actually watchful. There are faithful remnant that are there in the church of Sardis. So as always, I thank God for people that are there in churches who are watchful, who are diligent. Because God takes care of the church because of these saints who pour out their hearts in prayer and dedication and commitment to the body of Christ. I thank God for that. 
And then he gives the promise to the overcomer. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. White garments signify the righteousness of Christ that is imbued. He who overcomes only will be wearing his white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. The possibility is saying that if we are not watchful, your name could be blotted out. He's saying, I will not blot out your name from the book of life, but I'll confess my name, confess his name before my father and before his angels. Isn't it strange how many times the word name occurs? City of Sardis had a name, but didn't have a lifestyle. It's lost its value. Here is the promises for all the churches that we've seen so far. Let me wrap it up. Ephesus neglected its priorities. We need to overcome the neglected priorities in life, my friends. Give what belongs to God. Smyrna, be ready to overcome the satanic opposition. The enemy has plans to take you down so that you can focus on your condition, not your position. Be ready to fight that. Be ready to overcome like Pergamum. Be ready to overcome spiritual compromise. Look for the truth of the word of God. Thyatira, overcome the pagan practices that we have in our own lives, in our churches and everything because God expects that from that church and overcome uh, the lack of watchfulness and diligence in our life. We need to be watchful. We need to be diligent. Here are the overcomer's promises. For the Ephesus, he said, you'll eat from the tree of life. To Smyrna, he said, you'll not be hurt by second death. To Pergamum, he says, I give you manna, a a stone with your name written on it. And Thyatira, he says, he'll give you power over the nations. And Sardis, he says, you'll be clothed in white and your name will not be blotted out. We have a faithful God who is giving us an opportunity. We are living in this time of grace. It's important that we take hold of his hand, take hold of his truth, and walk this narrow and the straight path. Because there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end there is death. If you're not watchful, we're going to wander and we're going to be destroyed. So let's be circumspect and pack our suitcases because the king is coming. The king is coming to take us all away. Let's be diligent. Let's be circumspect.